the SPLM SPLA IO are positioned on the implementation of the roadmap. Uh, he has highlighted that we met as a party, the highest organ, uh, executive organ, uh, which is the political bureau met on the 13th February 2024 uh, here in Juba, in which we evaluated the roadmap. And uh, we consulted reports from the different mechanisms that is tasked to imp uh, implement uh, the peace agreement. And these mechanisms are the RGMEC, which is the monitoring body, the NCAC, which is the law review uh, body, the SDSRB, uh, which is involved with the uh, designing the strategic policy of the security sector, uh, the CITISAM VM, which is the, the ceasefire monitoring body, the JDB, which is overseeing the unification uh, of the forces and the entire security arrangement, the JMCC also uh, overseeing the cantonments of forces, the JTSC overseeing the training and the unification of forces, the SSM overseeing the entire security sector, uh, 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 I mean the uh, security arrangements for the transitional period, and the DDR. We also consulted reports from the members of the SPLM, SPLA, IO, assigned in the Artigon, both in the executive and also uh, in the legislature at the national level and also at the state level. And the following were our uh, findings. One, uh, on the objectives of the roadmap. You remember the roadmap when the three-year transitional period ended. We had to uh, search our souls as parties in order to chart way forward with the peace process. At the time, we were faced with the two scenarios. Either the country crashes, where the implementation of the peace agreement was uh, uh, outstanding with a lot of pending tasks, or we improvise for a roadmap. We can help the parties and also the country to proceed with the implementation of the pending task. Indeed, the roadmap was signed by the parties. And for the last two years, we are now in the final year, and we are left with nine months, actually, uh, apparently. So this roadmap, we recall that the extension of the 24 months period of the RRCs was necessary to end the transitional period peacefully and democratically by 22nd February 2025 in order to usher in a new political dispensation in the country. We have been having transitional periods since 2005. Even the constitution that we have now is a transitional constitution. I know you will realize later others want to hold elections without constitution on the basis of the transitional constitution. Something which is contradicting the concept of the revitalized peace agreement and also the concept of the roadmap. We underscore the fact that the following fundamental milestones in the implementation of the RRCs have been achieved, including establishment of the major institutions of Artigono at the national, state, and local government levels, the ongoing security arrangements implementation 
including the permanent ceasefire. The permanent ceasefire is largely holding. We want to attest to that. Cantonment of forces is ongoing. Training of forces for phase one has finished. We are left with the phase two. But we are left with the deployment of these forces, something which we expect to be done. Review and enactment of the constitutional amendment bills Amendment Bill Number Six, Amendment Bill Number Seven, Number Eight, Number Nine, Number Ten. We have done that. These are milestones in the implementation of the agreement. There are also some key reform legislations, over 20 of them, that we manage to review and amend. Some of them are passed already into laws, enacted. Others are yet to be enacted. These are milestones that we registered during this period of implementation. Opening up humanitarian corridors for humanitarian access and intervention all over South Sudan, including reviewing, I mean receiving some returnees and refugees from the neighboring countries. The conflict in Sudan led to influx. We managed to receive our brothers from the Sudan. And some returnees also managed to come back from Ethiopia, from the Sudan, and uh, neighboring countries. This one we have registered that. Conducting Transitional Justice Mechanism Conference aim at Establishing the Commission for Truth, Reconciliation, and Healing, Compensation and Reparation Authority, and the Hybrid Court for South Sudan. This conference was done, and it now lays the basis for the establishment of the transitional justice mechanisms, including Truth, Reconciliation, and Healing, Compensation and Reparation Authority, and the hybrid court. We expect this to be done. F, receiving, reviving rather, the oil production in JPOC and SPOC, oil fields, especially in Unity State. Prior to 2018 revitalized peace agreement, the oil in these two uh, Areas like Tarjath and 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 and, and uh, uh, unit in Unity State was closed down because of the war. But in Khartoum, we reached an agreement on this pertinent matter, and we decided to revive the oil production, which pushed back the production of oil per day. We have been uh, reported in Parliament that the production per day stands at 170,000 barrels per day. And this is a milestone during the implementation of the Revitalized Peace Agreement. Introduction of major reforms in the oil sector, such as cost recovery audit, environmental audit, Human Resource Unified Human Resource Policy Manual and Local Content Regulations. These reforms were introduced in the Ministry of Petroleum. And this is for the benefit of our country and the citizens. Conducting of National Economic Conference aimed at ushering in economic reforms, including establishment of relevant institutions such as Economic and Financial Management Authority, EFMA. This is as a result of the revitalized peace agreement. EFMA is to be overseen by a board, and the board is to be led by the president. 
So this conference has already taken place, and we expect the establishment of these two bodies, which are very critical for the management of our economy. The constitution of important democratic institutions, such as the National Constitutional Review Commission, NCRC, and the Political Parties Council, PPC, and the National Election Commission, marking, and I want to highlight this and underline this, marking the commencement of political transition and reform processes. These are very critical institutions. One that will deliver the constitution, permanent constitution, with a system of government, terminating the transitional constitution, which we have now, ushering us to a new political dispensation. We cannot exit the current transition unless we have a new constitution, which will terminate or repeal the transitional constitution so that the next government will not be a transitional government. It will be a fully pledged elected in a free and fair democratic elections. Three, noting that the prerequisites for conducting peaceful, transparent, democratic, free, fair, and credible elections at the end of the transitional period in the Republic of South Sudan have not yet been fully implemented. Much as we have registered milestones, which I highlighted before, we are also now noting on a very serious note that the prerequisite for conducting elections are still wanting, and they are part of the agreement. One of them, completion of security arrangements, phase one and phase two. I told you some work is already ongoing. In phase one, you are left with the deployments of these forces. Only six battalions were deployed out of 81,000 troops, unified uh, forces. Only six battalions were deployed. That is more or less like 7,000 out of 81,000. So we expect these troops to be deployed. Phase one, I mean two, should kick off with the training, they should kick off. Beginning actually with the cantonment, the forces that are still trapped in the assembly areas must move to the cantonments, and they should also go for the training like the way phase one was done. And we expect also the SSPDF to undergo the same. Permanent constitution making process. All right. We already have the commission in place. The commission has already been reconstituted. That will operationalize the permanent constitution making process. We now expect the preparatory subcommittee that should embark on organizing the National Constitutional Conference. We expect the CDC, the Constitutional Drafting Committee. We expect the National Constitutional Conference to be planned by the Preparatory Subcommittee. Since we have the NCRC now reconstituted, mm -hmm. we expect this work now not to take time. They should proceed immediately with the budget availability. The NCRC and the relevant bodies must proceed to deliver a permanent constitution for the people of South Sudan. And this constitution will be people's driven. 
and people led. Conduct of population census is also very critical. Judicial reforms is very critical. Already there is some work ongoing about judicial reforms. The Judicial Reform Committee, they are now finalizing their reports that will be submitted to Artigonu. And in this report, it will be the basis of reforming the judiciary so that we have an independent judiciary that is not leaning to any political party in the Republic of South Sudan, where justice can be dispensed to every citizen, whether an individual or a group. This is what we are looking for. So judicial service reform, I mean, uh, judicial reform committee report is very, very critical. Moreover, we even still don't have the constitutional court which has been enshrined in the revitalized peace agreement. Repatriation of refugees and resettlement of internally displaced persons. These are very, very important matters for our people. Transitional justice mechanisms. Since we have the conference have already taken place and also the law drafted, this law will be enacted as soon as possible for the establishment of the relevant bodies of the transitional justice. We shall achieve the unity and reconciliation of our citizens. This is what our country yearn most. Our country needs a united population. I should be able to travel anywhere in the country without anybody pointing at my back or trying to target me. And should I go for elections, I should go for elections with a clear manifesto where I will be voted anywhere in the Republic of South Sudan on the basis of my programs, not on the basis of my tribe or region. Dissemination of the peace agreement is also very critical. Many people are still up to now are not aware of the content of the peace agreement, including, by the way, government officials at all levels. You had the other day the chairman of electoral commission talking in isolation that the commission is ready to hold elections, not knowing the relationship between the work of the electoral commission and the work of the Constitutional Review Commission and the work of the census and the work of the security arrangements mechanisms is not privy to this. So we need to disseminate the peace agreement, including also to the chair of the National Election Commission. Pre-election activities is very, very key. We cannot be talking about elections and not conducting the pre-election activities. Up to now, the Electoral Commission does not have a budget. The office headquarters is just in a tiny compound which cannot even receive the entire ballot papers for the whole country. And that compound is being rented. You will be shocked when I tell you that it has now gone over two years that the rent has not been paid. How do you hold elections when you have not even prepared the infrastructure? You don't have the offices. At the national level, the headquarters does not exist. What if the landlord might be, as we are holding this conference, he might be in the court or he's on his way to close the office. What, what shall we do? So the pre-election activities must be done. And we have been informed that the supplementary budget 
is catering for the pre-election activities. But the parliament is in recess. And today is what? It's first of March. That means we are also left with only three months to finalize the financial year. To finalize the financial year, we are left with only three months. And moreover, according to the law, according to the law, the actual function of the budget ends two months prior to the end of the financial year. That means by April, next month, we are supposed to be working on the new budget for 2024-2025 financial year. Look at this complication. Artigonu has enough on its plate to deliver prior to the end of the transitional period. Political and civic space. We have been reiterating this. I'm sure you know it. Because even you, the journalists, are suffering from it. The human rights activists are suffering from it. Others are in exile. Our chairman and commander in chief is not free to move. You cannot hold your birthday party without getting permission from the national security. And worst of all, the National Security Amendment Bill has installed in the parliament. Why? Because there are those who want to retain two sections, section 54 and section 55, so that they can use the excessive force to clamp down on the civil liberties and the political space in the Republic of South Sudan. <coughs> This must be worked on. And these are prerequisites for elections. All I have highlighted are the prerequisites for conducting free, fair, and credible elections. <laughs> reiterating, reiterating that the implementation of the Arab Assets is the only viable means to end political violence. We are now talking of relative peace. It is not absolute peace. What South Sudan is looking for is durable, sustainable peace. We cannot transit on the basis of relative peace. If we don't unify the army, the forces, the police and the rest, what if a lunatic decides to trigger a war? The country will plunge back into conflict. That's why we want all the forces to be unified. So political violence and the cycle of political transitions in the country as the Arasis addresses the root causes of the conflict and provides a federal system of governance that undertakes transformative reforms in a multi-party democracy. This is the objective of the Arasis. And the roadmap does not depart from this. The roadmap actually is to facilitate the achievement of this objective of the Arab Assis. For you and me to be in peace in this country, where the graduates on the street can have the jobs, the employment, the economy can leave money in your pockets and your bank account, you can send your kids to school, and also be able to travel around the world. Now look at us, we are confined in the Republic of South Sudan. You cannot even get a ticket to go and look for goods and services around the world, or even in the region. We are trapped in our own country. Cognizant that the Arasis is to lay the foundation for a united, peaceful, and prosperous society based on constitutionalism, justice, equality, respect for human rights, and the rule of law for South Sudan to emerge as a viable state capable of protecting and serving its citizens. We are also concerned 
of the fact that the roadmap comes to an end in 12 months without the pending task. And the critical prerequisites for elections mentioned above being fully implemented. The roadmap is coming to an end without implementing what I've highlighted in terms of the pending task, the prerequisites for elections. The question that back now is, what should be done? And we shall tell you shortly. Ladies and gentlemen, over the period of the roadmap, we have also registered critical violations of the revitalized agreement, something which could not allow us to move as we plan in 2018. And as we plan when the roadmap was signed. One of them, taking over of the SPLM IO allocated Ministry of Petroleum by the SPLM IG through the Republican Order Number no. 3, 2024, stripping the Minister of Petroleum of his powers and arrogating the same to the Under Secretary and the Director General of Petroleum Authority. I've told you this is one of our points. We'll give you the leaflets later. The Minister of Petroleum, as it stands now, it belongs to IG. For what reason, we don't know. But what we know, it is a violation of the agreement, it's a violation of the Constitution, where everybody in this country has taken an oath with, including the president, the first vice president, and everybody who took an oath in this country. The constitution has been violated. The Petroleum Act has been violated. The Civil Service Act 2011 has also been violated. The EPSA Exploration Agreement Binding the Republic of South Sudan and the partners in the oil sector, the GOCs. These arrangements, this agreement has been violated. Now the Undersecretary is acting as if he was the minister. This is how the Ministry of Petroleum has been taken. For whatever reasons, we are still investigating as a party. This is a great concern to us. Continuous harassment, intimidation, arbitrary arrest, detention, torture, and forced disappearances of members of I.O. in the states. For example, the continued arrest and detention of four senior officers and two bodyguards in Tori town of Eastern Equatoria and have been in detention for over a year without trials. It is only now in the region that South Sudan is the only country that can arrest you, detain you for, all, for years without trials. And this can be done in the national security service facilities the military intelligence service facilities without any trials. <coughs> Denial of participation of SPLM, SPLA, IO, and other parties in the government of the three administration, I mean administrative areas. Article 1.16.2 read together with Article 162, sub-Article 1, 
A of the Constitutional Amendment Act number seven. Up to now, we have been denied access to the administrative areas. We cannot participate there. And somebody is planning to hold elections. We are asking what kind of election is this? And to us, on this basis, election is already rigged. Should you prevent other parties from participating in other parts of the country, should you prevent other parties from moving around the country, conducting their business, already this is an irregularity, even before you hold elections. That's why these are prerequisites that must be cleared before you talk of any elections, if you want a credible, peaceful elections. Encouraging hostile propaganda and hate speeches against the SPLM, SPLIO, and its leadership using state media. You have seen. Even the government spokesperson the other day was saying the agreement is not a Quran or a Bible. You can imagine this kind of attitude towards an agreement that has led to permanent ceasefire in our country, to relative peace in our country, to a government of national unity, an agreement that is aimed at uniting the citizens, the population of South Sudan. The agreement which put an end to the massacres, to the killings, in this country. Somebody says it's not a Quran nor a Bible. But we, are, we have accepted to live with the agreement and we will always stand with the agreement because we know what it means to the ordinary citizens of our country. Lack of political space and civil liberties manifested by continuous obstruction of other parties from freely assembling and holding public meetings and rallies. I've elaborated on this. Might be another example you, you may need is when there was a reception for uh, Dr. Lama call to receive him by SOA. The gathering was scattered, even when the, one of the vice presidents for service cluster was to attend. They scattered the gathering. And this is just a reception where people are going to eat and drink. They even don't want that. Showing hostility to and, as, and attacking the RRCs and its institutions publicly in the state media. One example I've already given you. And the other example, when they say the parliament was illegitimate, that the, the reconstituted parliament was illegitimate. The parliamentarians also ask, if we are illegitimate, you also in the executive, you are illegitimate. Why? Because all of us were legitimized by the agreement. Nobody was elected in the, in the Republic of South Sudan. The last elections was in the, in the Sudan. So where is Honorable Makwe getting his legitimacy from, if it is not from the agreement? Obstruction and denial of freedom of movements of leaders of I.O. have already mentioned this. Continuous harassment, detention, of media personnel, civil society, etc. I told you, you are also a victim of this. Encouraging and incentivizing military defections and receiving the defectors officially at the SPLM IG party headquarters. You have seen this one all over the place. I know you could be dull of hearing this, 
but we shall not stop mentioning them for the records because there are those who will come after us should we leave bad history behind us there are those who will come after us 20 years from now 50 years from now they will know what went wrong and who are the ones responsible renewed attacks on the SPLM I mean on the SPLA IO assembly areas and cantonments in Unity State in Yuel Yuel of Rup Corner and Kawari and Namurle of Central Equatorial State in Terkeka County. These ones were recent violations. They are those ones that we overcame them. But these are fresh ones. While people are talking of elections, people are talking of peaceful elections, they are also attacking and bridging the permanent ceasefire. And we have refused to be lured into the logic of dragging the country back to, to war. That's why we still maintain our peace and self-defense. <laughs> We want South Sudanese, we want our citizens to have a breathing air. They have suffered a lot. Creation of parallel structures outside the agreed structures in the military, in the national security, for instance. While we are discussing unification of forces and agreeing on the departments and offices, our counterparts are thinking of something different. For instance, Assistant Chief of Defense Forces for Procurement, police, is splitting the training department into training and human resource development departments. Just because these offices falls under IO, or opposition, and they will create another to counter it. Bad faith in the implementation of the agreement. Failure to adhere to the implementation matrix of the RRCs, including roadmap timelines. This alone is a breach of the agreement. If the agreement says within 24 months you must have a permanent constitution in place and you don't want to do it. It is a violation. And this is what we are talking about. They are failing to adhere to all this. Refusal to pass the National Security Act 2014 Amendment Bill. I've already talked about it. Ladies and gentlemen, the status of the peace implementation is very clear. Now you have the picture. There are a number of activities that are pending in all the chapters. Chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. They are pending. I'm not going to read all of them since you are going to have the copies of this and you have also could have read already uh, our position papers. But I would like to go towards the, cons the conclusion. There are other matters of national concern that we as a party are also very concerned about. One, prevalence of subnational violence among communities and organized forces vis-a-vis -vis the communities, namely in Warabi State, Agwok fighting Apuk, Twitch fighting Mok, and those in Marialbai, they are fighting.
a BA administrative area over the last few months have experienced some of the worst violence. And moreover, this is a special administrative area between us and the Sudan. We are yet to resolve its status. Western Barakazal, the Jew River, there is restlessness. Pibur administrative areas, jungle estate, you have been following this. Upper Nile estate, especially in the eastern Upper Nile. Areas of my wood. Nasir, look recently, last week, but one. Fighting between the youth and the National Army. The National Army shot and murdered two members of the youth and wounded the third, which provoked the youth to revenge and fighting and shoot. These are the subnational violence, some of which involves the army and the citizens. And it appears to be rampant all over the country, Eastern Equatoria, in Budi, Kafoita the other day, Western Equatoria, you had some declaration of fronts in Western Equatoria. Unity State. all over the country. This is concerning us because in the process of these people are dying and the security arrangement is being affected by forces even outside the agreement. Lack of transparency in the use of oil money. Now there is economic free fall. There is economic free fault. Inflation is to the sky. Lack of dollar. The SSP has lost value completely. And as a party, we still actually project even worst case scenario. I don't want to tell you that might be which will begin carrying SSP in bucks and sacks because it has lost value. Might be for you to buy a bread, you need a bag to carry the money so that you can go and buy a loft of bread. And we are not also hearing any effective policy guidelines from the Minister of Finance and also from the Central Bank to address this matter. This will affect the peace process, including the conduct of elections. The Rome talks with the whole out groups. We want these talks not to collapse. It must continue so that we have a sustainable, durable, and inclusive peace. And those brothers also should come one day and participate in the elections. We cannot be talking about elections and also talking about the peace process. It is as if we already know the outcome of the peace talks. 
or else we are not serious about it. Because if we don't know the outcome of the peace talks, how can we talk about elections leaving behind those ones who are at the negotiating tables, who are still in the bushes, fighting, and our people are getting killed in the process. The conflict in the Sudan, I've highlighted, is also of concern to us, the impact of climate change. Even if you want to plan elections, you must plan taking into consideration the climate factor. Because other parts of the country, there is no good all-weather road, especially in Upper Nile. You cannot drive during rainy season. You have to use river transport. That means even electoral commission must improvise either air transport or river transport. And all these activities are not there. They are not planning for it. There is need, therefore, to discuss these foregoing issues as they affect the peace implementation and the conduct of elections in the Republic of South Sudan. The way forward, in light of the above, the timelines for critical tasks that are prerequisites to the conduct of elections are as follows. And these timelines, they are not just our creation. We went through the original matrix of the agreement. We also evaluated the work that has already so far been done. For instance, in the constitutional making process and so on. And we came up with the conclusion that the activity A requires this time. Activity this requires this time. We have already read that some of you concluded on your own that I.O. is asking for two, for two years. We have not yet declared that, but we have gone through the timeline of the agreement and said, based on our evaluation, based on the work done and the work not done, this activity requires this, this activity requires this. And for those who say they are ready for elections in 20, 24 December 22nd, unless they tell us the miracles of achieving all these pending tasks within the remaining period, or else they are planning abrogation of the agreement then there will be no government of national unity. Because the government of national unity is founded on the basis of collegial collaboration and consensus. Any unilateralism for that matter will abrogate the agreement completely and jeopardize all the milestones that I've highlighted to you earlier on. We shall get back to square one. So follow with me that on the way forward, A, completion of security arrangements, phase one and phase two, to be completed within eight months. You remember the original timeline of the pre-transitional period, where most of the activities, including security ar arrangements, were to be completed within eight months. We are looking at, okay, we have opened the cantonments, we have done some trainings, we are left with the deployments of a still the larger part of phase one forces. That means we are still left with the enough work under security arrangements. Phase one, only six battalions deployed out of 81,000 troops. 
That's why we say, okay, within eight months, the original time frame, permanent constitution making process to be completed within 24 months. The original time frame was 24 months. But now we have seen the NCRC that is tasked with this purpose is already in place. We said we welcome this. This is a very good development. But now the actual activities must begin. Give the NCRC budget so that it can proceed and deliver the constitution. Conduct of population census within 16 months. Judicial reforms within eight months, including establishing the constitutional court, reviewing the current status of the, of course, it's coming with the reform committee reports. Actually, the judiciary of the Republic of South Sudan should be overhauled. You cannot have a chief justice who is a member of a political party. The other day you watch it, you look at him, he was in WOW endorsing a candidate for the elections. Should we then go for elections and have dispute over elections? Who do we petition? This same man who is in red? Or we petition somebody who is independent and neutral? Who can dispense justice to all of us? So judicial reform is critical within eight months. Repatriation of refugees and resettlement of the IDPs within eight months. I have failed to understand why there is lack of political will to bring our people away from the POCs, the ones in Juba, in Malakal, in uh, Jongole, Bur, in uh, Unity State, in Wau. They are still under the UN. And we are an independent country. And we have a government. But our citizens are in the hands of <coughs> foreign bodies, the refugees, over two million, actually three million, they are still outside the country. And our population according to the last census, was what? It was 8.2. But then we say, no, we should be 12 million. But out of the 8.2, over 3 million are in diaspora. And there is lack of political will. The government is not taking care of its people getting them out from this condition in POCs. I'm told even in the POCs now, there are names of kids that are named after those places. Nya POC. You have Nya Kampala. Because our people are in diaspora. Transitional justice mechanism, that is establishing these bodies, the Commission for Truth, Re Reconciliation and Healing, Reparation Authority, Hybrid Court, within four months. Why? Because the conference has been done and the bills are already also in place. Dissemination of the peace agreement within six months. 
the constitution of independent commissions and institutions within one month. This does not require money for you to announce the reconstitution. The names are ready. Our nominees are ready. But there is lack of political will on the other side. Pre-election activities require a minimum of 11 months, especially voter registration. You need the budget, whether supplementary budget or actual budget, you need it. You need the office infrastructures at all levels, logistics. You need the software for elections. You need to design the ballots. All this must be done. Given the above mentioned prerequisites, it is the constitutional making process which has the longest timeline that will determine the end of the transitional period and the other concurrent activities, including setting the time for elections. In the light of this, it is imperative that the parties to the agreement must dialogue among themselves in order to chart the way forward to allow for the implementation of these critical activities that are extremely important for peaceful and democratic end of the transitional period. We as a party would like to reiterate our full commitment to the implementation of the R assets as the only viable option for peaceful and democratic transition. This was our evaluation of the roadmap. In brief and summary, the Republican order number three that separated the powers have also removed, as I told you earlier, the ministry from us, and now it has become for SPLM IG. And we are saying this order was as a result of misinterpretation and violation of Article 106A. 4B of the Constitution. And by the way, the order also cited this article, but left out very fundamental subclause consultation and agreement. Yes, the President can initiate reforms, but it should be in consultation and agreement of the first vice president and other vice presidents. And in this particular case, the ministry, which was allocated to SPLM IO, the first vice president should have been consulted and him also agreeing to what was to be done but it has not taken place. The order violated the agreement, Article 1.9.4.3, because there was no consultation and there was no agreement. The order is also a violation of Article 1.9.1 of the agreement, which says the Artigonu is founded on the premise that there shall be collegial collaboration in decision making and continuous consultation within the presidency between the president, the first vice president, and the four vice presidents. This has not taken place. We have also noted that points number three, four, and five in the order it strips the powers and the functions of the minister, clearly violating Article 1141 of the Constitution as amended, which states that a minister 
in the national government shall be the head of his or her ministry and his or her decisions shall prevail. Now these powers is given to under secretary. For what reason? They know better. But we are investigating the motive of removing the powers of the minister and giving it to under secretary. To achieve what? Which the minister cannot do in his legal mandate. The order violates the Civil Service Act, Section 14A, on accountability, which states that an undersecretary shall be responsible to the appropriate minister. Now the undersecretary is not responsible to the Minister of Petroleum. He travels the way he wants. Ever since this decree came, he travels now more than how many times? To Middle East, Saudi Arabia, Dubai, wherever, without even taking permission from his minister. He's going to transact the business of the ministry. He now writes letters directly and copying the minister to GOCs, even to foreign governments. But he's not a member of Council of Ministers. He cannot even be someone in the parliament. He's a civil servant. The parliament has got nothing to do with him, except he should account through his minister. Look at this decree. The order strips the powers and functions of the minister over management of the joint operating companies, GOCs, violating chapter 20 and chapter 21 of the Petroleum Act. The order violates articles 34, 35 of the Exploration and Production Sharing Agreements, EPSAS, between the government of the Republic of South Sudan and the joint operating companies on work programs, budgets, and approval procedures, and transportation system, respectively. The order violated the construction obligations in EPSAS and the subsequent amendment thereto. The only legitimate representative of the government of South Sudan, of the Republic of South Sudan, and mark this too, the government of South Sudan is one thing, the Republic of South Sudan is another thing. The representative is the minister of petroleum. He can negotiate with the foreign governments on any matter as directed by the government and the republic. And those governments will take him as the legitimate representative of his country, but not a civil servant who is not accountable to the parliament, who is not a member of the Council of Ministers. If he negotiates an agreement now in Dubai, for instance, or Saudi Arabia, will he come and report in the Council of Ministers? He's not a member. He cannot even come to the parliament and report because that one is not the procedure in the conduct of business. You can now see the constitutional crisis that this Republican decree is potentially throwing the country into. So we go and sign any agreements, be it loans or whatever, with anybody out there, who will recognize 20 years from now or 50 years from now? Our children may not recognize this, but if it is the, the minister who was the member of Council of Ministers of the time, who was sanctioned by the parliament at the time, then our children may recognize those undertakings. So this is about the Republican decree. And lastly, 
The other will jeopardize the reforms. All right? Will jeopardize the reforms by the minister, namely the cost recovery audit, the environmental audit, the unified human resource policy manual, the implementation of local content regulations. Probably you in the media, you were asking, or you will ask shortly, why did this order come about? I mean, uh, came about, uh, come about. The elephants in the room are this. There are people resisting reforms in the ministry of petroleum. Some of them are even the GOCs. Like the Unified Human Resource Policy Manual. The GOCs has been resisting it and we have also observed them colluding with some South Sudanese who are benefiting from their tables. But the minister took this bold step. The environmental audit. You are aware that you cannot take pictures in the oil fields. You cannot take selfies in the oil fields, my friend. You will be arrested and even your gadgets confiscated. Why? Because of the pollution that is going on there. Some of the reports have already reached the parliament. There are people who are born without skins. They don't have skins. You can see through. This is a result of pollution. But the environmental audit are meant to uncover all this and report it to the parliament, and we take action. Whoever pollutes the Republic of South Sudan under any name must pay. Must pay. And there are those who want to default. And they are conspiring. Taban Intum Junubin, Mabaruf Hak Bitaku. You even conspire with the Ajanib. This is what has transpired in the ministry. The order is therefore not an initiation of institutional reform, but rather arrogates the powers of the minister to the undersecretary. That was the purpose of the order. So that the undersecretary achieve what they know better. The order takes away the ministry from SPLM IO, abrogating the agreement. In light of the above, the SPLM SPLA IO political bureau rejects the order and calls upon the president to uphold the constitution to uphold the agreement, to uphold all the other relevant laws, to uphold the EPSAS, and to reverse the Republican order number three, 2024. We have taken oath, we are under oath by the different legal instruments, the agreement, the constitution and so on and we must respect these laws <coughs> constitutionalism is fundamental for south sudan to emerge as democratic as a free society as a just and prosperous we must be law abiding beginning with the leaders the constitution making process to be done by the elected government also would be done after the elections. First of all, you cannot put the cut before the horse. If you want to ride, my friend, you must put the horse in front in order to pull the cut. 
The objective of the revitalized agreement is to end the transitional period. We have a transitional constitution in place that has been running since 2011. We have it in place. So you carry out elections under the current constitution, which practically and legally you cannot, unless you amend it, you must amend the current constitution to allow you whole elections. Why? Because the agreement which has been signed is incorporated in the current transitional constitution. Why? It's so that the implementation of the agreement takes place within a specified period and then it terminates the transition. Then you go for a new political era a democratic political dispensation. If you go now to hold elections under the current circumstance, first of all, you will hit constitutional crisis. That is one. Two, you would have not ended the transitional period. You will go for another transition because the constitution that you will have will be a transitional constitution which will govern a transitional government. For how long does South Sudan want to remain under this political transition? We are saying you must have a permanent constitution to repeal the transitional con con constitution in order to terminate the transition. The transition goes and you have a permanent constitution with a system of government, with a definition of a state and boundaries, resolving the question of number of states. You remember the question of number of states is not yet resolved. We only reverted the country to 10 states. There were 28 states, and then 32 states. There were 21 states. Others, we are talking of three states. All these are still hanging, awaiting the permanent constitution debate. You remember the conflict in Upper Nile? You remember we have people in POCs in Malakal complaining of their land. Even if we reverted the country to 10 states, they are still complaining and fearing that their land has been grabbed. The permanent constitution is coming to address a fundamental question in the Republic of South Sudan to do with the system of government. This has been the root causes of the conflict. Actually, since 1947, we have been in the quest for a federal system of government. Even with Khartoum, the CPA only fell short of declaring that the, the six years transitional period will be governed under federal system. That's why you have the constitution now with some futures of federalism. It's because of the aspiration of the South Sudanese people. We have also understood that the question actually is not whether you have the constitution before or after the elections. The question is there are parties and there are individuals in this country who are fearing federal system of government. To tell you a fact, they are fearing federal system of government. Others are even rubbishing it that it is corporate. Others are saying the federal system of government is coming to review the centralized system then they will lose the privileges, the privileges of having all the powers in the center and controlling resources in the center. But federal system is a system of government just like in the US, in South Africa, 
in Nigeria, in Germany and wherever, where powers are divided among the levels of government, where services are brought closer to the people. Look at the economic crisis now. It's because of over-centralization of powers and resources at the center and mismanaging the same. So the question of permanent constitution is a must. Moreover, the agreement says it must come before. So whoever wants the permanent constitution to be enacted after the elections is planning to abrogate the, cons I mean the, the agreement itself and plunging the country into constitutional crisis and all other uncertainties. Repatriation of IDPs and the refugees. You cannot liken the situation of those years in the old Sudan with the situation now. Now, South Sudanese, they have their own country. The struggle within the Sudan, the old Sudan, 1955 to 1972, you have this transitional period of the Addis Ababa Agreement, where many people were skeptical about that agreement, that it will not hold. And indeed, the agreement was abrogated by Nimeri in 83, 82. Okay? And then the country relapsed into violence, where SPLA, SPLM, pick up arms again. This is what kept our people outside the country. They wanted their own country. But now you have your own country as South Sudanese. Why do you want to keep people in other people's country without services? They have no education system there. They cannot go and get employment. They don't have full rights in those countries. Why do you want them to remain in other people's countries? And the IDPs here have elaborated a lot of it. The harrowing conditions of our IDPs in the POCs. That is being insensitive to the aspiration and the needs of the South Sudanese people. That's why we are saying they should be repatriated. Yes, we understand the international instruments regarding voluntary repatriation. But the country, the government, must show seriousness that they are ready to welcome the people back to the country. Because some South Sudanese are capable of coming on their own. By the way, some of them have just settled along the border. Like in Tarfam in Ethiopia, they can just walk back. Like here in Palabek, in Uganda, in Moyo, in Yumbe. These people can walk back. You don't need a lot of undertaking. You just create conducive environment. Let them see seriousness in security arrangements and political will. They will come back to their country and vote. This is what we are saying. Our position regarding election is very clear. Elections should take place after implementing the prerequisites. Without prerequisites, how do you reach elections? The prerequisites are very key for you to achieve elections. Elections is not the answer to the problems of South Sudanese. You know, those who say you hold elections without implementing the agreement, I'm sure you read the position of other parties, SOA and OPPs and so on, and SPLM IEG. They are actually insensitive to the prevailing circumstances of the country. I pity our counterparts in other opposition parties. Why? Because we also understand that probably they have limited stake in what is going on. For instance, in security arrangements, they, they don't have forces in the cantonment. Yes, SOA has been having some 
roaming officers. But in the cantonment, they don't have forces. I always still have forces. Actually, the large bulk of the forces are still behind, awaiting phase two. So somebody can sit in this small party and say, oh, I think I can go for elections. Not knowing that IG, which is armed with all sort of forces and militias, and IO, which have forces in the assembly areas and cantonments, and in training centers like Gudmakur and so on, they still want to settle the fate of these forces, that they must be deployed. And moreover, these same forces are the ones that will take charge of the security of elections. But other parties, they don't know this because they don't, they don't have the, 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 the forces. Okay. So our position are for the prerequisites to be implemented. And we are saying the parties, particularly the SPLM IEG and the SPLM IO, must dialogue and get a way forward to this. Because we are now sure that given the fact that we are left with only nine months to the deadline for elections as in the roadmap, and you have all these pending tasks not implemented, it is impossible for Artigonu now to hold elections come 22nd December 2024. It's impossible. Unless if they are looking for a sham elections, unless if they are just looking to abrogate the agreement, which will throw the country into confusion. Because we are part of our forces now in the unified, being deployed. Others are in the cantonments and training centers. So you take unilateral decision to obstruct this process. What will you do with the forces now already unified? And these ones which are still to be unified, what will you do with them? The country will be in confusion. And who will be re responsible? The one who abrogated the peace process. When we did not have the deployment of forces, remember during the roadmap, the forces were not deployed. They were trapped in the training centers. We also did not have the reconstitution of the Electoral Commission. We did not have the reconstitution of the National Constitution Review Commission and the Political Parties Council, who were asked this question. What miracle will we have? We managed to have these bodies reconstituted, all right? We also managed to deploy the six battalions, okay? We now have a mechanism of managing our counterparts with all the intransigence, with all the lack of political will, and so on. We have been overcoming many violations, and so on. We managed to register the milestones that I have highlighted to you. The ongoing security arrangements, the reconstruction of these bodies, and others. I'm sure with the bodies now reconstituted, especially those having direct bearings on elections, if you give them the budget, the finance, they will deliver. We are confident on the people that we have nominated and appointed in those bodies. They will deliver the required task of the permanent constitution, of the uh, security arrangements, and so on. 
this is one. The security, uh, national security uh, uh, act amendment bill is stalled in the parliament. It is the two sections, section 54 and section 55, which the SPLM, let me call them by their names, the SPLM IG, they are the ones who want to retain these two sections. Contrary to the resolutions of the Council of Ministers, contrary to the expert advice of the Attorney General of the government, of the Minister of Legal, I mean Minister of Justice, contrary to the resolution and the decision of the two principles, that these two sections should be scrapped because the powers does not belong to the national security. The powers belong to the police, the CAD. National security is only concerned with the small aspect of criminal uh, uh, provisions of our penal, I mean, uh, penal court. All right? All right? The crimes against the state, they are only to investigate and report to the relevant authorities. We are not going to be part of any process that will abrogate the peace agreement. We are not going to be part of any elections that will be sham, that will not be free and fair that will be held in violations of the peace agreement. We will not accept it. We will not accept it. Any elections you plan or whoever plans to hold in violation of the peace agreement, in abrogation of the peace agreement, we will not be part of it. And we will immediately, will immediately register abrogation of the agreement to the grantors and the international community. What we have called for is dialogue among the parties. That is one. We want to hear from the SPLM IG, from SOA, from OPP, from FDs. When they say they're, they're going for elections on 22nd December 2024, we want to hear from them. Will it be without fulfilling the prerequisites? Will it be at the expense of the peace agreement or not? They should tell us the miracles of achieving the pending task within the time frame that is left. If they convince us that actually by December 22nd, 2024, we would have the new constitution we would have all the security arrangement in place. We will have uh, the census have been done and everything done. We will say, mashallah. But if not, then that means they are planning to abrogate the agreement, something which we shall not accept. Actually, we have many strategies. One, we already have a task force that the party has put in place to dialogue with the representatives of those other parties. Dialogue is one strategy. The second, we'll use the expert advice of the bodies that have been reconstituted. Those in the NCRC, those in the National Election Commission, and those in the Census Bureau. They will advise the parties. Politicians, by the way, we are laymen when it comes to technical issues like in the Bureau of Statistics. When it comes to holding census, we can declare, yes, we want census. But how to go about it, it is the preserve of the enumerators and the technical people. The technical people are in the Electoral Commission. They know the activities, the workload, the time required. They will tell us. That's why the dialogue that will be done among the parties 
will be informed by the technical advice. Even UNMIS will be there, the partners will be there. We have all the civil society, they are there, including you in the, in the press. If you have ideas, also you help the parties. Because they are stranded now. They are stranded, trying to implement the agreement for four years, they cannot, and so on, with all the violations. If you have any constructive ideas, you tell us. Thank you very much.